starting with um, acute gastrointestinal con conditions. The first case is of necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, it's a very common um, neonatal condition and demonstrated by this case showing symmetric distension of uh, air-filled uh, bowel loops and uh, intramural air uh, outlining the bowel segments in the right upper quadrant. You can appreciate a sliver of air outlining the bowel loop in the right upper quadrant and intrahepatic air outlining the portal venous system an aunt mini of our necrotizing enterocolitis in a neonate. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a disease of, is a condition of a neonatal age group. The age of onset is directly proportional to the gestational age. So the, 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 the more the premature the child is, the earlier the presentation of necrotizing enterocolitis. However, it is very rare in the first couple of days of life. It takes the, the, the bacteria to colonize the gut. It mainly affects premature infants. However, um, Drum infants, especially with congenital heart disease and surgery, are also at risk for necrotizing enterocolitis. Clinical signs are nonspecific, uh, and so are radiological signs, especially in the early, in, in the early phase. And uh, the only finding that you might have can be like diffuse symmetric distension or asymmetric focal distension uh, and distribution of bowel segments. Persistent loop sign is an helpful early sign, which basically means a lack of peristalsis in a dead bowel and persistence of air-filled segment in an abdomen on uh, subsequent follow-up radiographs. Pneumatosis, portal venous air, and pneumoperitoneum are more definitive for diagnosis. However, they present only in advanced cases. Pneumoperitoneum is a surgical emergency and uh, usually requires exploration. This is an example of uh, extensive pneumoperitoneum. Now, pneumoperitoneum can be difficult to diagnose in children because most of the films are uh, taken acquired in supine position. And the only thing that you would uh, look for while looking for pneumoperitoneum is to find an interface of air with the soft tissues. Difficult cases are when pneumoperitoneum is extensive rather than when it is subtle. In this case, you can see massive pneumoperitoneum and uh, the only finding you can appreciate is an interface formed by the air with the soft tissues along the lateral, so lateral abdomen. And that can be confirmed very easily on the lateral decubitus radiograph showing a large intraperitoneal air fluid level. Other differential diagnosis for pneumoperitoneum in a newborn, apart from necrotizing enterocolitis, would include spontaneous or iatrogenic gastric perforation, isolated small bowel perforation from an intrauterine ischemic event, perforation secondary to obstruction, most common being Hirschsprung's disease, distal ileal or jejunal atresia, and obstruction related to meconium ileus. Thermometer or enema tip placement can cause an iatrogenic rectal or sigmoid perforation. Very rarely, pneumoperitoneum um, can, be a, can be a result of decompression of uh, tension pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum in the peritoneal cavity. Another um, important uh, acute GI condition is malrotation and midgut volvulus. Uh, the classical presentation clinically is of bilious amesis and it's a surgical emergency. Radiologically, the diagnosis is made by demonstrating abnormal position of duodenojejunal junction by upper GI series the normal position being uh, to the left of the left side of spine at the level of the ordinal bulb. Uh, in equivocal cases, uh, you may proceed to performing contrast enema and demonstrating abnormal position of the cecum, which is uh, in cases of malrotation in the midline and uh, high in the right upper quadrant. However, it can be in normal position in 20 to 30 percent of the cases. Hence, contrast enema is not uh, usually the first line of investigation for malrotation. An example for malrotation, a plain film showing a distended air-filled stomach and non-specific absence of air in rest of the abdomen in a child presenting with bilious amesis and an upper GI series confirming low-lying um, duodenojejunal junction, although it is just crossing over the midline and lying to the left of the spine. This was a case of malrotation. Uh, note that midgut volvulus may not always be encountered depending on what stage the imaging is done. In this patient, the midgut volvulus was not encountered. Usually malrotation uh, can be isolated, but uh, there are a few conditions which have very strong association with malrotation, common amongst them being uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which has a very high association with malrotation, anterior abdominal wall abnormalities like omphalocele, gastroschisis, and prune belly syndrome have high association with malrotation, and so does situs abnormalities like heterotaxy. Uh, another common acute GI condition is hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Unlike malrotation and volvulus. This is a very common cause of projectile non-bilious vomiting and the commonest cause of gastric outlet obstruction. Um, the age of onset is after three weeks uh, to up to three months of age. Uh, very rarely it can present earlier than three weeks as well. Uh, boys are affected more than girls and usually uh, ultrasound 
preceded by plain film is the imaging line of uh, management. This is a plain film in a patient with hypertrophic pyloric stenosis presenting with uh, projectile non bilious vomiting, a fairly non specific appearance, distended air filled stomach, and non specific distension of bowel segments in the rest of the abdomen. Ultrasound at the level of the pylorus showing thickening, of the pylor thickening and elongation of the pyloric channel. Measurement wise, uh, individual muscle thickness greater than 3 mm has high sensitivity for diagnosis. Similarly, length of the pyloric channel greater than 15 mm are considered um, sensitive criteria. However, uh, more important than that is to, to actually demonstrate absence of passage of fluid through the pyloric channel. In conditions where the ultrasound measurements do not meet the criteria for diagnosis, uh, as happens in um, patients presenting with a shorter clinical history or in an earlier age group, uh, usually imaging is done at five to seven days because hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is progressive and by one week or um, 10 days, it usually meets the criteria for um, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis to warrant surgery. Another condition is intussusception. It's a very common uh, condition uh, presenting with crampy abdominal pain and in a classical case presenting with bloody stool and often a palpable mass. Age of presentation is uh, six months to four years. Presentation outside this age group always has a leading cause, a lead, a lead point as a cause for intussusception. In this age group, it's usually an idiopathic intussusception. Evaluation is with plain films followed by ultrasound. You may not always encounter the classic um, uh, crescent sign or soft tissue in the uh, area of intussusception. Uh, the best thing to do is to get a lateral decubitus radiograph to demonstrate an obstruction in a child presenting with a bilious or non-bilious MSS. Ultrasound in this patient in the right upper quadrant uh, shows a classical um, bowel within bowel appearance uh, or target appearance of intussusception. The next line of management um, is to get a contrast enema or air enema for reduction. As, is, as it is in this case, uh, the contrast enema shows a sausage-shaped filling defect at the level of uh, hepatic flexure and ascending colon. Acute appendicitis is obviously the most uh, important condition in pediatric population presenting with acute fright lower quadrant pain and uh, diagnosis is usually straightforward. Uh, the focus should be on uh, detecting complications like perforation and abscess formation uh, or in negative cases uh, looking for other etiologies of fright lower quadrant pain. This is a very classical example of distended air and uh, fluid-filled appendix with a multiple appendicles and fat straining of surrounding mesentery. Moving forward uh, to acute airway and respiratory conditions, some of these cases are uh, we already looked at in Dr. Cohen's lecture, so I would go uh, briefly through them. This is a classical example of retropharyngeal abscess with um, exuberant prevertebral soft tissue forming a convex anterior margin. Note the alignment of the cervical vertebral bodies. In cases of um, retropharyngeal abscess or any retropharyngeal inflammatory process, not only is there loss of normal cervical lordosis, you can actually see reversal of the cervical spinal curvature, which is again a helpful sign to differentiate um, just redundant uh, retropharyngeal soft tissue from inflammatory retropharyngeal soft tissue. Uh, there is compression of the hypopharyngeal and supraglottic airway and the CT scan uh, shows a fluid attenuation dream enhancing collection in the retropharynx consistent with abscess. Typical age of presentation is in younger children, uh, six to 12 months being the peak incidence. The clinical presentation would be classical with stiff neck, dysphagia and strider. Radiographs are not very reliable to differentiate retropharyngeal cellulitis from abscess uh, very rarely as we saw the case of a foreign body within retropharynx. If you can demonstrate air within the soft tissues on a pain film, it is diagnostic of abscess and it, it can be pro the patient can proceed to aspiration. However, a CT scan is performed in almost all the cases as it helps in uh, differentiating the location of uh, the abscess, uh, retropharyngeal versus parapharyngeal, in which the excess of drainage can be different, and the nature of soft tissue swelling being uh, cellulitis from abscess. Another common uh, upper, not a common, but a, a very severe upper airway condition is epiglottitis. Again, an aunt mini on the lateral radiograph of the neck, you can see a bulbous enlargement of the epiglottis and thickening of the epiglottic fold. And on the frontal radiograph, uh, we can see um, symmetric uh, diffuse narrowing of the subglottic airway. Epiglottitis is a life-threatening emergency. We already discussed about that. However, it is not very frequently seen because of uh, immunization against H. influenzae. The common age group is 3 to 14 years. Croup is another uh, acute condition. It's, it's usually a diagnosis, it's a, usually a clinical diagnosis uh, affecting children from uh, six months to three years of age, presenting with uh, barking cough uh, with or without inspiratory striders. So 
imaging is not usually indicated and um, you can you can encounter uh, subglottic narrowing on chest radiographs performed on those children for looking to look look performed to look for pulmonary abnormalities again there would be symmetric narrowing of the subglottic airway on lateral radiograph however um, there would be absence of any thickening of epiglottis or ap epiglottic fold the classical teaching is you should get a lateral radiograph to rule out epiglottitis however the clinical scenario the age group and the incidence are are much much different in both the both the etiologists to uh, avoid a lateral radiograph of the neck a passing uh, look at a specific pediatric condition um, pediatric pulmonary condition uh, round pneumonia this is specific in age group of less than 8 years where um, there is uh, inadequate development of a collateral air drift mechanism which results in consolidations or pneumonia being very focal and without any air bronchogram this is cons this is called a round pneumonia the clinical importance of this of knowing this is that it can be confused with uh, metastatic or primary lung neoplasm it is typically seen in 8 years of 8 year or less of age group and it is almost always in the lower lobes and posterior and follow up radiographs show gradual resolution of the abnormality this is an example of demonstration case for airway foreign body aspiration we saw a couple of cases before and this patient uh, with a non radio opaque right main stem uh, right bronchial foreign body obstruction this is a lateral right lateral decubitus and left lateral decubitus radiograph on the right lateral decubitus radiograph there is failure of collapse of the right lung suggesting air trap mechanism and this patient with a non radio opaque foreign body obstruction diagnosis of airway foreign body can be uh, challenging because uh, the symptoms may not be uh, may not be consistent they may be indolent aspiration may not be witnessed and the child may not cooperate with inspiratory and expiratory phases of uh, radiographs a typical age group is 8 months to 3 years of age if there is a high degree of suspicion um, bronchoscopic exploration is warranted ct scan does not help in um, changing the management because detection or non detection of foreign body does not um, alter the the management anyhow a quick look a quick look at uh, certain uh, acute respiratory condition in neonatal population in intensive care setting uh, include pulmonary interstitial emphysema pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum this is an example of uh, pulmonary interstitial emphysema manifested as irregular lucencies uh, with bilateral symmetric distribution predominantly in the upper lobe in a background of uh, diffuse fine opacities in this patient with respiratory distress syndrome these are um, air trapped in the pulmonary interstitium and uh, are as a result of increased ventilatory settings and barotrauma if not controlled um, and if the high ventilatory settings persist then this can progress to pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum which are fairly commonly encountered in pediatric in neonatal population this is an example of a subtle pneumothorax on the right side manifested as a deep right sulcus sign a sliver of air in the subpulmonic pleural space and loculation of pneumothorax in the anterior mediastinum uh, with generalized lucency of the right lung space as compared to the left this is an example of uh, pneumomediastinum manifesting as lucency overlying the mediastinum and displacement of the thymus uh, above the cardiac silhouette it is important to differentiate pneumomediastinum from pneumothorax because this does not need an, an, any uh, additional line placement or drainage and it would spontaneously resolve whereas a pneumothorax would need some sort of intervention to decomp to decompress moving forward to um, acute genito urinary condition starting with a uh, longitudinal sonogram of um, kidney um, showing changes of pyelonephritis on ultrasound we can see ill defined hypoechoic and interspersed echogenic areas within the renal parenchyma with complete loss of cardiac medullary differentiation this is a patient with known pyelonephritis usually ultrasound is not the first investigation for diagnosing pyelonephritis per se but it is the first investigation in children presenting with urinary tract infection and it is helpful to know the ultrasound appearance of pyelonephritis in an established case of pyelonephritis imaging is not usually warranted unless uh, you are looking for complications like uh, pyelonephrosis or renal abscess and in those cases ct scan is much more sensitive uh, than ultrasound another acute gi condition is testicular torsion this is the second most common cause of acute scrotum in children this is an ultrasound showing transverse images of bilateral testicles with color doppler evaluation showing normal flow in the right testicle and absence of flow in the left testicle which shows minimal heterogeneity of echo texture and diffuse enlargement 
Testicular torsion is a is an is a condition of adolescent and young adults. Most of the cases are intravaginal torsion. It is a surgical emergency as the salvage of the testes depends on the duration of um, torsion. And after 24 hours, it is almost an unsalvageable testes. On grayscale imaging, uh, the testes is usually normal in the first few hours of life. In the first two hours uh, of torsion, and color Doppler is much more effective in. Uh, putting the diagnosis. Absence of flow in the painful testes is the criteria for testicular torsion. However, there can be an incomplete torsion and presence of flow in a painful testis does not com completely exclude torsion. And in the, comp in the correct clinical scenario, it is necessary to uh, explore and detorse the kidney, detorse the testes. The most common cause of acute scrotum in uh, children is acute epididymitis. This is a transverse ultrasound at the level of epididymis, showing heterogeneous enhancement of the right epididymis. Longitudinal ultrasound of the right testes uh, with color Doppler evaluation showing uh, diffuse increased blood flow within the epididymis with normal intratesticular. This is a classic example of acute epididymitis. This is the most common cause of acute scrotal pain, as I said. Uh, the etiology differs in different age group. It's more, more, more of an infectious etiology in adolescent and uh, prepubertal age group, and uh, more of a congenital abnormality by means of an ectopic draining ureter in the seminal vesicle or in the vas deferens as a mechanism or etiopathology in younger age group. As compared to torsion, the symptom, the onset of symptoms is much gradual. There are fewer constitutional associated symptoms. The, infl in the inflammation is localized to the, uh, uh, the epididymis. However, in 20% of the cases, it may actually spread to the testis causing orchitis. An uncommon uh, condition um, of acute lower abdominal pain in adolescent age group is adenexal torsion. Uh, you have comparative ultrasounds, uh, transvaginal ultrasounds of the bilateral adenexy. And on the right side, there is a heterogeneous large adenexal mass, normal ovary on the left side and color Doppler evaluation shows absence of flow on the right side and normal intratesticular flow on the left side. This is a case of right adenexal torsion, which involves both the ovary and the fallopian tube. Adenexal torsion is usually encountered in adolescent and young women, and it does not usually uh, need a predisposing adenexal lesion. It can be encountered in younger population, uh, neonates and infants, um, but there is almost always an adenexal lesion predisposing to torsion. Uh, the classical presentation is with uh, lower abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And just like a testicular torsion, the salvage of the adenex depends on the duration of torsion. This is a CT image in the same patient showing heterogeneity and enlargement of the right adenexa in a patient presenting with uh, acute lower quadrant pain and uh, showing moderate ascites as well. A brief overview of um, skeletal trauma in pediatric population. The pediatric fractures and skeletal injuries are different from adult injuries because of uh, several pathophysiological uh, differences in a pediatric skeleton. Starting with the growth plate, uh, this is the weakest part of the pediatric skeleton. Mechanisms that would usually lead to sprains or strain in an adult population would cause injury to the growth plate in pediatric population. The pediatric skeleton um, has a higher percentage of woven bone as compared to Havertian bone. Hence, uh, fractures would, which would normally, injuries that would normally lead to displaced fracture in adult population would lead to uh, fracture, fracture patterns called torus and bowing fractures in children. The periosteum is very loosely attached. So um, you can see in the, in the healing phase, there would be exuberant bridging callus. And the periosteum, although loosely attached, is very thick and strong and it is very rarely torn. So the remodeling and the union is faster and complete as compared to adult population. Starting with fractures involving the growth plate, this comprise 20% of all fractures, about two thirds of the fractures in involving 10 to 16 years of age group. Classification um, uh, is by Salter Harris classification. Type one to type, type five, you are very much familiar with this classification. Quick look at the examples of different um, Salter types of fracture. This is the Salter one fracture passing through the growth plate. Uh, you can see widening of the growth plate of the distal ulna in comparison with the normal growth plate thickness of the radius on the same side. Example of Salter II fracture, uh, fracture through the metaphysis extending through the growth plate with displacement. So this is a displaced Salter, displaced type II Salter Harris fracture. This is an example of Salter type III fracture which involves the epiphysis and the growth plate. Example of Salter type IV fracture involving the met posterior metaphysis epiphysis and the growth plate of the distal tibia.
fractures not involving the growth plate in pediatric population. The typical patterns are bowing fracture, torus fracture, and green stick fracture. Quick look at certain examples. Uh, this is an example of bowing fracture, which is basically a plastic deformation of the bone. The plasticity of the bone in pediatric population is much greater than in adult population. Hence, the bone does not uh, fracture up to a certain degree of tensile uh, loading. This is commonly seen in forearm bones. Prognosis is excellent and uh, it may remodel even without manipulation if it is less than 20 degree angulation. An example of torus fracture, this is a result of axial loading on a cortex that is not, um, that has less biomechanical strength uh, as compared to adult population resulting in buckling of the cortex perpendicular to the uh, direction of the axial load. They are also known as buckle fracture and they are most common in the distal radius, fall on outstretched hands being the most common mechanism of injury. An example of green stick fracture, uh, these are uh, an extended extension of the spectrum of um, plastic fractures uh, in which there is complete failure of tensile strength at one point leading to fracture in one aspect of the cortex. As you can see, fracture in the ulnar aspect of both the ulnar and radial cortex with intact um, the medial aspect of the cortex, or sorry, the radial aspect of the cortex. These are called green stick fractures. Some characteristic fractures in different age groups. This is an example of toddler's fracture, um, typically seen uh, from nine months to three years of age group. Toddler's fractures can also involve fibula, talus, and cuboid and the classical presentation would be a limp or refusal to bear weight. They are typically spiral fractures traversing through the mid or the lower one third of diaphysis of tibia and may be very subtle to detect. Amongst several fractures in this age group, uh, this is a representative. This is a bunk bed fracture, which is basically a buccal fracture of the first proximal, meta proximal aspect of the first metacarpal, typically seen in three to six years of age group. And the classical clinical history would be fall or jump from a height on a hardwood floor. And you can see buckling of the proximal aspect here. Evulsion fractures are a specific pattern of fractures seen in ad adolescent population. On the right is an example of uh, evulsion of ischial tuberosity. On the left is an example of evulsion fracture involving the lesser trochanter. As I said, growth plates are the weakest point, weakest uh, structure in the pediatric skeleton. And normally, a ligamentous injury at this site, a hamstring injury would lead to ligamentous sprain or strain. But in adolescent or uh, younger population, this would lead to avulsion of the apophysis, which pathophysiology-wise is actually a Salter 1 type fracture. Other common sites of um, avulsion fracture include anterior and superior anterior and superior, uh, sorry, anterior superior iliac spine and anterior inferior iliac spine, greater trochanter, and very rarely the iliac crest. Uh, there is always a characteristic injury mechanism associated with specific types of um, avulsion injuries, depending on the muscle and ligament group in involved. Amongst the several um, fracture dislocation combination, um, just putting a representative case, this is a case of Montagia fracture with dislocation of the radiocapitular joint. Uh, the Montagia pattern involves a uh, fracture of the uh, proximal or mid one third of the radius with dislocation of the radiocapitular joint. And another fracture associated with this in the forearm of the same pattern uh, is um, the Galazi uh, fracture dislocation combination, which involves distal radius and disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint. A quick look at fractures at specific location, starting with fractures along, around elbow joint. And these are the uh, normal lines that we usually uh, use to uh, detect supracondylar fractures and radiocapitular alignment, most common amongst them being the anterior humeral line and radiocapitular line. It is helpful to remember the order of ossification and the duration, the time of onset of ossification of various uh, ossification centers around the elbow joint. And uh, this is a very uh, familiar uh, a mnemonic starting from capitulum till the lateral epicondyle the ossification centers proceed in this manner around the elbow joint the commonest supra, commonest elbow fracture includes supracondylar fracture followed by lateral and medial lateral condylar and medial epicondylar fracture uncommon fractures include the radial neck and olecranon fracture I'll quickly show you some examples. Um, this is an example of supracondylar fracture with disruption of the anterior humeral line, posterior displacement of the capitulum. Uh, there is um, moderate to severe joint effusion demonstrated by displacement of the anterior and posterior fat pads, and the frontal radiograph shows an obvious fracture in the supracondylar humerus.
Lateral condylar fracture can be subtle to diagnose, uh, as, in, as it is in this case. Soft tissue swelling, but you can, if you can appreciate a sliver of bone, better appreciated on the oblique projection, which is a displaced lateral condylar fracture. Example of medial epicondylar avulsion, soft tissue swelling um, overlying the medial elbow with displacement of the medial epicondylar ep ossification center. Examples of radial neck fracture, uh, this is an example of displaced radial neck fracture. Example of um, longitudinal fracture, non-displaced fracture of the olecranon. Fractures at, um, around the ankle joint um, have a specific complex pattern because of the pattern of a peculiar pattern of closure of the growth plate, which proceeds from a medial point, which is called Kump's bump, involves the medial aspect of the epiphysis and sorry, growth plate, and then proceeds laterally to involve the lateral part of the growth plate. And this results in complex uh, and classical patterns of injury around the ankle joint. Uh, the two most common amongst them being juvenile tilo fracture, uh, which is a salter three fracture through the epiphysis and the growth plate, and triplane fracture, which is a fracture through the which is a salter four fracture through the metaphysis, epiphysis, and the growth plate. In both this fracture, um, CT scan is usually used uh, because. Uh, it is important to uh, demonstrate the displacement of the fracture fragment and the congruity, congruence of the articular aspect of the epiphysis. Almost all of these cases need internal fixation surgically.